We're up to our entire interview, our second interview with Carmine Apice, where we talk about his days in Vanilla Fudge. They're still doing their thing. His new album, Cactus, with a star-studded cast. His days with Rod Stewart, some Led Zeppelin stories that are pretty juicy, and a lot more. Carmine Apice, drummer extraordinaire, on Rock History Book. Carmine Apice was born December 15th, 1946 in Brooklyn, New York. He's an iconic American rock drummer renowned for his powerful and innovative playing style. Beginning his career in the mid-60s, Apice first gained prominence as a member of the psychedelic rock group Vanilla Fudge, where he helped pioneer a heavier, more dynamic approach to rock drumming, and of course influencing countless musicians in different genres. Peace's career continued to ascend as he co-founded the hard rock group Cactus and later joined the legendary Jeff Beck group, further solidifying his reputation as a versatile and formidable drummer. His distinctive style is characterized by a complex rhythm, intricate fills, and a commanding stage presence. In the mid-70s, Peace joined Rod Stewart's band, contributing to several hit albums and co-writing chart-topping songs like Do You Think I'm Sexy and Young Turks. His work with Stewart showcased his ability to seamlessly blend rock, pop, and funk influences. Throughout his career, Apice has played with artists like Ozzy Osbourne, Ted Nugent, and Blue Murder. He's also authored several very popular books and videos on drumming. His enduring legacy of rock music is marked by his technical prowess, innovation, and lasting impact on the drumming community. Carmine Apice's latest project is with his iconic band, Cactus called Temple of Blues, Influences and Friends. Featuring along with the current Cactus Band, we have guitarists Joe Bonamassa, Ted Nugent, Pat Travers, Warren Hayes, Vernon Reed, Steve Stevens, Johnny A of the Yardbirds, bassist Billy Sheen of Mr. Big, Doug Pinnock of King's X, Tony Franklin of The Firm and Blue Murder, Rudy Sarzo of Quiet Riot and Ozzy Osbourne, as well as members from Government Mule, Vixen, Rainbow, Zebra and Whitesnake. This is it. You're supposed to be slowing down, my friend, but you're <laughs> this. I listen to this. And I'm going, I don't know if a 20 year old could do. I listen to the album going, what the, where does, where does that come from? Where do you get it? Like, what is it? I don't know. That the playing came easy, you know, organizing it all, you know, which is uh, calling my friends and talking about it. And uh, luckily I have, I have good friends, you know, and, uh, the album idea came from Brian Pereira, who owns uh, Cleopatra Records. And uh, I can honestly say we just got word today that we broke in the Billboard charts on the blues chart at number three. Which hey, is congratulations. Awesome. You know, I haven't been on a blues on, on any album chart on Billboard in many years because of all the streaming baloney, you know. But uh, very happy about it. I mean, I must say. And, uh, you know, the idea of this thing came from the, uh, the record label, from Brian Pereira on the label, you know, on their label. And, and it, according to him, it does really well. We make a little bit of royalty. And, and, uh, and he came up with this idea. He said, you know, what about doing an album of people that Cactus influenced? I said, well, yes, we could do that. What about influences and friends, you know? He said, that's great. And then after we did it all, I was watching uh, my buddies from the uh, Foghat and Robin Trower on the blues charts on Billboard going to number one, number three, number five, all over the place. And I said to Brian, I said, we should market this as a blues record because that's what the blues rock bands of the 70s are doing now. And he said, OK, let's call it Temple of Blues. I said, great. So we had that album cover. You saw the album cover, right? And when I did that album cover, I said, I want it to be like Sergeant Peppers, you know, with all the people that played on the record. And so the, the guy that, that actually did the artwork, he made it look like uh, Sergeant Pepper with the, you know, all the outfits. I said, no, no, not exactly like Sergeant Pepper, but just the idea of having everyone out in the same place. So we got that done. So when we changed the Temple of Blues, then we changed it to the whole concept of CDs and artwork was a temple. 
right? So all these guys were in the Temple of Blues and everything, and everything came out great. And it sort of just step by step kept building towards the end. And now what we wanted it to be was on the Billboard charts. And here it is, number three. One way or another is the biggest one, uh, but the, that kick-ass, get out of my freaking way, I'm too busy getting a speeding ticket, Parchment Farm, uh, yeah. Joe Bonamassa. Uh, tell me about that tune. Then. Well, that was on our first album, and uh, that's always been a favorite. That one and Evil, and one way or another, were the three favorites of the, first, of the beginning Cactus album. And they're all on different albums. First album is Parchment Farm, second album, Evil. Third album, uh, one way or another, second album, third album was evil. So the one of, of each album. And uh, <clears throat> when I did the inter, uh, Joe, Joe Bonamassa's podcast, he told me that track blew me away, Parchment Farm. So it's like a freight train. I said, yeah, it is like a freight train. So, you know, so I said, we're doing this album. I explained it to him. I'd love for you to play on it. He said, okay. So. So we got him on that track. Same thing with Nugent. Yeah, Nugent was a big Cactus McCarty and Tim Bogart, Carmine Peace fan. And and uh, when I asked him to play on it, he said, no problem. He played on my guitar's record, uh, one and two back in the day, you know, back in the 90s. And uh, you know, so he was okay. And I knew uh, King's X guys would play on it. They love Cactus. And uh, they can claim Cactus is one of their influences. And so I asked Doug if he would play bass and sing on one way or another with me and Ted. And he said, definitely. You know, and then Dee Schneider, I knew had done evil before, right? With his band Widowmaker. And one of my drum students was in his band, Joe Franco. So I said, uh, you want to sing on this? He said, immediately, I'm in, mm. you know? And McCarty didn't think that, didn't know him really well. So he thought, wow, that Twisted Sister singer, come on. I said, I'm telling you, it's going to be great. So when I played it for him, he goes, who's that singer? I said, that Twisted Sister singer. He said, wow, he sounds like Rusty. I said, yeah, I told you, you know. And uh, so that came out great. And then uh, right now we're, we're working to try and get the video out with uh, Parchment Farm. I don't know if we can get Bonamassa in it because he's so busy, but we got his playing in it. Music fans are so weird. It's like when you look at Elton John, everyone looks at Nigel Olsen as the best drummer. He was for Elton John, but Roger Pope, who played on two of his albums, was technically a better player. He, he knew more tricks. It's almost like they go, no, it's Nigel. I'm going, I know that. It's good. But someone's allowed to teach another drummer stuff. And just because you love John Bonham no, no, doesn't mean Carmine no. Peace didn't teach him stuff. No, no. The deal is this. Joe Morello, who's a great, great drummer from De Buba Quartet, take five. He once said to me, nobody has it all. We all take from each other. Period. For me, I took from Gene Krupa, Buddy Rich, Max Roach, and Joe Morello. You know? So, and John Bonham liked Gene Cooper and Buddy Rich and me and some other guys. And he took from me and them. And I, I you know, Cozy Pal took from me and other guys. And it uh, goes down the line, you know, goes down the line. We, Billy Cobham taught us all something. Billy got it from somebody else. I mean, it's just the way it goes. Why? All those guys are dead. You're alive. You're You're very coherent. You're an amazing player. Why have you survived all this? I read your book. Well, there you go. I had fun. <laughs> now, I wasn't really a drug addict or a drinker or a smoker. Like Tim Bogart died of lung cancer. He smoked like a fiend. You know, uh, different guys, you know, they drank to death. John Bonham drank himself to death, you know, and he was young. But, you know, I think that's partly it. I, I exercise. I had a good, I have a good, uh, my parent, my father lived to 87, which is only 10 years older than me now. What did your dad do, by the way? My dad was a, he was a cop for a minute. He was a oil burner mechanic in Brooklyn, which was a really dirty job. But he did it. And he got a pension on it. And he raised the whole family on it, you know. But it was like, you know, crawling into cellars and all over Brooklyn, these dingy cellars and fixing the oil burners, you know? 
but he he did it because he, he I don't know if he loved what he did, but he did it because he had to bring up the family. You know, he was very proud of the fact that me and my brother Vinny made, and everyone in our family was successful in the business that they were in, and everybody in our family uh, now. My father hasn't seen it. Or, you know, my brother Frank is retired. He's 80, 81. He made a lot of money. My sister's an accountant. She's retired. She made a lot of money. My brother Vinny made a lot of money, and I made a lot of money. Carmine Apice's tenure with Rod Stewart began in the late 70s, and it marked a significant period in both his and Stewart's careers. Apice joined the band in 1977, bringing that big dynamic drumming style and rock credentials to the forefront. And he contributed to some of Stewart's most commercially successful albums. A piece's first major contribution came with the record Footloose and Fancy Free in 77. He was on the hit Hot Legs. His next project with Stewart was 1978 and Blondes Have More Fun. This was an era where they further cemented their partnership. A piece co-wrote the smash hit Do You Think I'm Sexy, which really became a defining song from the era which blended rock and disco and the song topped the charts worldwide. Throughout his time with Stewart, the piece's drumming was at the forefront. He played on more albums like Foolish Behavior in 1980, Tonight I'm Yours in 81, contributing the hit Young Turks as a co-writer. His collaboration with Stewart lasted till the early 80s. How did they react to you becoming this guy? How did, how did your family and friends well, my react? Mother loved, my mother loved it. She loved music. She used to be singing all the time while doing the dishes. And she eventually became, uh, she said, Mary's my name, rock and roll's my game. She had pads made up, you know, and it was great. So she was really proud, uh, really proud. My father was proud, but my father was all laid back. You know, I mean, I got pictures of my mother with Rod Stewart and my mother made lasagna for Jeff Beck and Rick Derringer and Rod Stewart and John Lennon. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, yeah, they, they're happy about it. I'm real happy. I mean, when I used to fill up in Brooklyn with my Pantera and I get out and I'm fully dressed for stage, I walk into the house, the whole block would go, Carmine's here. And they'll come to my mother's house and my mother would have cookies and coffee and everything for everybody, you know. And, uh, you know, she was a, uh, she was a rock and roll mom, you know. She loved it. And, uh, you know, when, when we played Madison Square Garden five nights with Rod Stewart, right in, in the middle of uh, Times Square, they had a big billboard. You know, Rod, at, you know, Rod with his band at the uh, Madison Square Garden, and it named everybody. You know? named, and I'm a junior, so my father's the same name. So I said, hey, Pop, well, look at that. And he looked up and he saw his name go. I said, see, there's your name on Broadway. And he was proud, you know. And then my brother Vinny, when Rick Derringer called my mother to ask for Vinny, she goes, oh, you want Carmine, not Vinny. She goes, no, I'm calling for Vinny. No, no, Rick, you're making a mistake. You're calling for Carmine. And he said, no, I know Carmine. He's my friend. I'm calling for Vinny. And Vinny was 17 years old. He went out on the road with Rick opening up for Aerosmith in stadiums, you know. So she couldn't believe that it was happening to Vinny, too. Carmine Apice was born December 15, 1946 in Brooklyn, New York. He's widely recognized as a pioneering rock drummer, most notably for his influential work with the psychedelic rock group Vanilla Fudge. That started in 1966, and Apice's drumming played a crucial role in defining the band's sound and influencing future drummers for years to come. Vanilla Fudge's music was characterized by its heavy, symphonic style blending rock and elements of even classical music. The piece's thundering drumming were a cornerstone of that sound. His approach was marked by complex rhythms, dynamic fills, and lots of levels of technical proficiency. That's what set him apart from other drummers at the time. The band's debut album, Vanilla Fudge, in 1967, featured the groundbreaking cover of The Supremes' You Keep Me Hanging On. And when young aspiring musicians first saw Carmine playing that song on the TV, it kind of changed their musical direction. They either thought, I'm never going to be able to do that, or else I want to learn how to do that. Throughout his time with Vanilla Fudge, a piece of drumming style evolved, incorporating elements of jazz, R&B, and classical music. This kind of versatility not only enhanced the band's unique sound, but it served as an example to show other drummers that you could cross-pollinate genres. His use of the double bass drum, his intricate patterns and powerful grooves, laid the foundation for many rock drummers 
His influence can be seen with John Bonham of Led Zeppelin, Neil Peart of Rush, and Ian Pace of Deep Purple. Vanilla Fudge released several albums, including The Beat Goes On and Renaissance in 68. You get in those rooms, Carmine, because you do the work. And you've got your and people like working with you and all those mother statements I could send out to you right now. But I, I think it was John Lodge uh, um, three weeks ago. I asked him, I said, do you believe in luck? Because, I mean, I'm not saying you were lucky. I, I'm No disrespect, but I'm saying uh, he said to me, totally. he said, I do the work so that when luck hits me i'm ready for it how do you look at being in the right place at the right time what's your philosophy well, on that i i can tell you exactly when it was and where it was <clears throat> it was 1966 i was playing with my group we played all over new york city we played opposite jimmy hendrix when he when he was jimmy james in the blue flames he wasn't hendrix yet and uh you know we played with the vagrants with leslie west in it I played all that thing. Billy Joel, he was in the hassles, you know. And I was playing at this club called the Choo Choo Club where the Rascals were known to play. And uh, this, these two guys came in and said, hey, look, we're looking for a drummer. We're looking for a guy that could sing, that, that's technically good and has a great right foot. He said, so we just heard you play. It sounds like you. I said, well, who are you? I'm Mark Stein. This is Tim Bogart. We have a band called The Pigeons. We work out from Long Island. We have a manager that'll put us on a salary so we can keep working and working to build a following and then maybe end up with a record deal and get some hit records. So I thought, well, I could either do this or not do it. If I didn't do it, I would stay with the band I was with to make $300 a week which in 1966 was good money. So, so first thing, let me go out and check them out. I went out and checked them out. Mark Stein was an amazing keyboard player, amazing singer. Tim Bogut, unbelievable bass player. I never played with a bass player like that. It was always left-hand bass on a keyboard. And Vinny Martell, great rhythm player, good lead player, and great vocal. Together, I used to sing doo-wop in, in Brooklyn, you know? We all we sounded like a duo vocal group. We could sing anything. Everybody had their place. I was always at the bottom. Vinny, Tim on the top, and Mark anywhere. Mark was the lead mostly, and and they played great. And I met the manager who was I had met before. He was a like a he played. In, he had this club. I played in the club before he bought it. And then he bought it, and uh, I said, "Oh man, the mafia took over this place," you know. He had a guy named Phil Basile, had a scar on his face. This guy Chubby was a nasty looking guy that you think he would shoot you in a minute. <clears throat> and they they were the managers. They said, we'll put you on a hundred dollars a week salary and just work it, build it to, to make this band great. So I said, you know what? I was also married at the time to my nine, I was 19, going on 20, to you know, my girlfriend from from high school, my parents said, you guys got to get married. You know, so we got married. Nine months later, I got an annulment. You know, but, and I went with those guys out of instinct. And that was my luck to go with these guys and hook up with them and build and build and build. And then we, we always noticed that all the arrangements we have done, because that was the fad in Long Island. Vagrants were huge at the time with Leslie West. They were playing 2,000 people a night. Every night they played my, my manager's club. And that's what we wanted to build up to. But in the meanwhile, we hooked up with a lawyer that got this, um, no, I'm sorry, hooked up with somebody that got this producer, Shadow Morton, took us in the studio. We did a demo of You Keep Hanging On. And that's what started it. And we, the demo that we cut became the album cut. Wow. Okay. And, you know, it was all new then. Everything was brand new back then. You know, so everything we did was uh, working towards that end, you know. And, all, and the whole album that we cut, the first album, was basically our stage thing we did on stage. The only thing we didn't do on that album was Shadow Morton brought in uh, Take Me For A Little While. The rest of the album was basically just us on stage. You keep me hanging. When when everyone saw uh, when you were on TV, 
the big TV show, for the first time, everyone talked about, they were all talking about how you were drumming. They were going, they, 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 they'd never I seen that before. I know. I was attacking the drums. And I look at it now, and I go, wow, you know, I, I, there's some shows on the internet, like, where they go, they review things from years ago that they never seen. So these people never saw you keep hanging on. And they rated from one to 10. But they gave us like a 12. You know, they said it was unbelievable. Then another show, it was a guy watching. He goes, whatever that drummer's on, I want some, you know? And it's funny watching their reactions of people today that never heard that and never saw yeah. it. Yeah. You know, but, you know, we started a whole thing. You know, me with my playing, Tim Bogle with his playing, singing, Mark's organ. And, uh, you know, we were considering a heavy rock, psychedelic heavy rock symphonic band, you know? Who was that younger Carmine? How would you describe that guy? Just a, a guy from Brooklyn that didn't know nothing, you know, just was enjoying what was happening, you know? I mean, I never went to college, you know, I graduated high school. Never had a great vocabulary or anything like that. I mean, on, on our second album, you know, a stupid album, they asked a question, you know, and I said, well, I, I don't know this or that, but I, all I know is I know drums. It was a very dumb answer. You know, but I get older, you know, get more experience. I was totally inexperienced at that time. And we were all inexperienced. That's why we did that album. We should have never done that album. The Beat Goes On is a terrible album for a second album. And it actually killed the Vanilla Fudge career, totally. Why? You know, why did it kill all it? The, all, the, all the momentum we had, there were no songs on it. It was called The Beat Goes On about, I don't know if you ever heard it, it's terrible. How music and, and uh, through everything survived, through wars and from the beginning of time. But there were no songs. The only song on it was Moonlight Sonata, the symphony, you know, Fleur de Lis. That was the only song on the album. So here we had a first album that was, Top 10 album, top, you know, it was the first album to go top 10 without a hit single, you know, smash album. Then we did the second album. Everyone that was with us, Jimi Hendrix, Queen, you know, all those albums that they released a the second album like the first, they all flew up the top 10. Mm -hmm. We didn't because we didn't do the second album like the first album. Stupid. But we didn't know. Yeah. Ahmed Erdogan, he owned the Atlantic Records. It was his idea to do it with Shadow Morton. But we could have done it as the seventh album, not the second album. Yeah. You know, killed us. So we had the momentum going, then it went, then we had to go do another album to try and bring it up. We did end up saving it a bit, but we still lost momentum, you know. But, uh, and then it kind of was one of the reasons why the band broke up eventually. The Mud Shark incident. <laughs> Led Zeppelin. The, the Mud Shark incident became a historical uh, part of rock and roll that was on. Uh, VH1 was on the shocking moments of VH1 and and uh, all that. I can say it was a groupie that I found, and uh, she would do anything to hang out with the bands, including that. And I told Frank Zapper about it in the Chicago airport. He wrote a song about it on his uh, live at uh, live at the film hall. So it was it was a real historical event back then, and became a historical. Uh, legendary event you know to you ted nugent is a friend a longtime friend a great guitarist a man of his own uh opinions which i love about him you don't give a hell about nobody you know but if he's on your side he's on your side mm -hmm. you know so he's on our side i know him since 1967 or 8 we did our first gig with Hendrix, him, and Vanilla Fudge. And uh, and then later on, my manager uh, started managing him, so we got to see him more and more. And we've been friends all through the years. I played with him after. I remember I, when I was playing with Rod, we did American Music Awards, and we, we just did Young Turks, and, uh, and, and Rod's music was getting a little wimpy, as Ted said. So he said, when you're done playing this wimpy rock and you want to play a man's rock, give me a call. So after I was done with Rod, I called Ted and I went immediately into Ted's band for a year. We did an album and touring with him and it was great, a lot of fun, you know? And we got closer then. His next album, uh, he, he got another band, but I, I did some other stuff on the album. I forgot what 
the percussion, the background vocals or something. And, you know, and I could see him in L.A. playing and all over, whatever. And we became friends. And I did the Guitar Zeus record. He played on uh, Guitar Zeus 1 and Guitar Zeus 2. And we've been friends all through the years, you know. And, uh, and basically, you know, we, we talked to each other on the phone, by texts. And when this album idea came about, I didn't even have to ask twice. I told him, we're going to do this. He goes, I'm in. It's like wow. that. So when we put it all together, I said, well, what song do you want to play? He said, I want to play one way or another. So he played it. He's the only guy that played the song, played the riff. And then when the verse came, he changed the riff to his own thing. And when I first heard it, I said, well, he's not playing the riff. I said, I said to my co-producer, Pat Regan, who mixed it. And I said, I like it, though. What do you think? He said, I like it, too. I said, well, let's leave it then. You know? So we, whenever the verses came, he changed the riff to his own, like, Ted Nugent kind of vibe. And it was cool. And then he would send us three tracks of guitars and solos, and, and then we would combine it all together and come up with what's on the album. We did it. I did the drums first of anything. Usually you put the drums after a vocal, I mean, after a guitar and a vocal. But I, I did the first two tracks, Posture Farm and, and uh, One Way or Another. Just put a click on. I just played to myself what, you know, and I played, you know, thinking about where, you know, where I was. But it was hard because today I can, like anybody else, I could punch drums in. If I didn't like the verse, I could redo it. But it was very difficult to do that because I had nothing to play to. So when you heard the drums, you, unless you really knew where you were in the song, I couldn't do that. So I'd have to write down, like, the verse starts here, the chorus starts here, you know, and, I, and it got to be a drag. So I said, it's got to be a better way. So I did, like, evil. I would I would put the click on, I go, bam, bam, da 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 and then I had something to play to without thinking. I could just listen to it and play to it. And that way also, if I wanted to punch something in, I knew where I was. You know, I, I just said uh, second verse, third verse, solo, 20 bars solo. You know, I knew where I, exactly where I was. And then I did the rest of the album like that. And then after that, I gave it to a, a singer, guitarist, harmonica player. He put a guitar, a vocal, and harmonica where necessary gave it to the bass player, and now I had demos. And I said, Ted, do you want this? Okay, I'm gonna, uh, Doug Pennick, what do you want? Can you play, play one way or another? They were big Cactus fans, yeah. King's X. When I played with Blue Murder and, and, and uh, Billy Squire went on their bus, they were opening up, they were playing Cactus on the bus. I said, I found out they were big Cactus fans. They also played on my guitars, this record. I said to Doug, can you play bass and sing one way or another? So sure. So we did that. Can you play evil? Yeah. Bass? Right. Okay. So I sent him the tracks for all that stuff. So he played bass on evil, played bass on one or another, and sang one way or another. And then I gave that to Ted Nugent. So now you got the drums, bass, and vocal. Now you put your guitar on. He put the guitar on. So it was all done with stems, you know? Yeah. And then they would send it back, and my engineer, Pat, co-producer, he put it all together. That's what his job was, to get it. I would get it done. i get the guy. I'd send it to him. he put it all together. And then uh, Evil, the same thing. I yeah. knew D. Snyder was a, a fan of Cactus. I knew he'd done Evil before, because uh, when he did it on his Widowmaker album, my one of my students, Joe Franco, played with him. And I was talking to him about the drum part that he played it wrong, you know? And I heard... At the time, I heard D singing it, so I thought D would be great to sing this. So I talked to Joe. He said, "Yeah, call D. He'll. I'm sure he'll do it in a minute." So I called D, and he said, "I'm in. Not even a hesitation. Just like Nugent, like that. I'm going to do this. So you want to do this? I'm in." Right. So he did it. And McCarty, our original guitar player, played on Evil. He said, "That guy from Twisted Sister going to sing this?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Oh, come on." I said, "Trust me, man." So after he was done, I sent it to McCarty. He said, who's singing that? I said, the guy from Twisted Sister. He goes, oh, my God. He sounds great. He sounds like Rusty. I said, yeah, he does. I said, told you so. 
Well, and that's how it went, you know, yeah. little by little. Some of the friends live in Colors Guy guitar. Vernon Reed. Yeah. Yeah. He was a friend. You know, I, I didn't know he might have been a Cactus fan. He never said so. <clears throat> so I got him. He's a friend. But people like Steve Stevens, I, I got, I said, you know, I'd like you to do this. I don't know if you if you know Cactus. I know Cactus. He goes, I'm from Brooklyn. He says, I know, I'm a fan of Cactus kind of thing. <clears throat> so some of the friends were ended up being fans, which I thought were only friends. Like also was Malcolm Mendoza and Doug Aldridge. They were fans. They were, I thought they were just friends. So it was great. Like uh, uh, Warren Haynes, <clears throat> the blues, that was a hard one because we played the drums first yeah. to the click. And then we put the bass on. Uh, Jorgen from Government Mule put the bass on. And he played it with me with my track in his house. And he said, I'm bringing the energy up like you did. And I think that would be where Warren will bring the energy up on the guitar. And then Warren did it, vocal and guitar at the same time, which was unique and it came out amazing. He's amazing anyway. How have you protected your back through the years as a drummer? My right leg, my, my hip is, uh, you know, I'm walking around New York City. That's why I don't like New York City. You got to walk everywhere. Yeah. You know, it aches. You know, I've had cortisone shots in my side. I've had, I got two, two uh, rotator cuff surgeries. You know, uh, it, it's definitely um, a lot going on for doing occupational drums. hazard. Definitely, you know, but uh, you know, I, I go to a chiropractor. I stretch. I yeah. I try and you know exercise I, every other day. I'm on the treadmill. Actually, believe it or not, when I'm on the treadmill, it feels better <clears throat> that day. The next day, it hurts. How's your makeup changed on the drums through the years? Gained and I reduced drums. So the, in the 80s, <clears throat> the King Cobra had three toms up front, two toms on the side, and a tom up here, aerial toms, China. You know, when I had the rotator cuff surgeries, I had two Chinas up here, and I was with Michael Schenker, and I hit this China. It was my left shoulder. It was hurting. When I hit this China. I had a pain. And so through my arm, I took my arm down. It was stuck there. All right, so after I had that surgery and stuff, I took that china down. Now the china is over here, not up there. I don't have the drums up there. I don't have anything that's high anymore, which I love the way it looked. Because I would do like ba 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 up here, the fast, you know, there, and then do over here, you know, like that. It looks great. Yeah. But I want this one went out anyway, and I did it, and this one's still not right, you know. So who has surprised you the most? Is there someone that maybe you had a preconceived idea of? Well, I guess Rod Stewart. Why? Me. Because he was a great performer. He was a great songwriter, great image. And he le I learned stuff from him like that. Before that, you know, I was with different bands. I, I didn't really get into the image thing at all, you know. But when I was with him, I started doing the black hair and the colors in my hair. And, and uh, all through the 80s, I was the only one that had hair on the face, you know. And uh, he used to use eye makeup on stage. And it makes your eyes look better on stage. I still do it, you know. I don't think he does it anymore, but I still do it a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, I did the image, you know, every time I did pictures. And he said, if you're going to do like I did drum clinics, make an event out of it. I just I did make events out. I gave money to, to UNICEF. I did PR. I did uh, giveaways. I made an event out of it. Wherever I went, I, I went all over the world and did the biggest drum clinics. I was the very first rock musician to do a drum clinic. I did clinics in, in Tokyo. I had 2,000 people. I did clinics in Australia with 2,000 people. In Europe, I had you know, 1,800 people in France in the theater. So I, I took the clinic to the next level in those days when really nobody else was doing it, you know? And uh, so I learned that from Rod and I learned how to write songs more from Rod. And I co-wrote the You Think I'm Sexy and, and Young Turks. And Sexy was the biggest song he ever had, period. Um, through that, I learned more about songwriting. I learned how, how to build a chorus and you know, try and get like, every song of his is a, is a daytime, a daily, um, same. Do you think I'm sexy? You're in my heart. 
you wear it well. Tonight's the night, right? You know what I'm saying? They were all, some guys have all the luck, forever young. You know, all these songs were daily sayings. You know, and I have a show that I'm doing called The Rod Tonight's the Night, A True Rod Experience. And it's, uh, you know, with a guy that looks like Rod, a girl that played with uh, uh, Rod for 14 years and me seven years. So we have, so it's like uh, music and stories. You know, like passion. If you look at the passion video, we're all wearing these sex police t-shirts. People go, what is that about? And it's like, you know, every, we used to put the shirts on and anyone that had a chick in the room, we go and harass him and ruin whatever he's doing, sometimes break the door down, you know, but we don't have the sex police t-shirts on. So uh, on my Rod show, I have sex police t-shirts and hats and I tell the story about it, you know, so they know now what the shirt means. So this people buy it, you know? And we tell stories and we play and this guy looks like Rod, sounds like Rod. And the other night when we were playing, I, I look at him prance around the stage like Rod used to do. And for his haircut, I felt like I was on stage with Rod again. It was, and you know, and I was involved in a lot of songs, you know, all these big songs, Hot Legs. Everybody thought I wrote it because the drums were so pom prominent on there. Hot Legs, uh, um, Young Turks, Passion, You're in My Heart, uh, Sexy, uh, goes down the line. All these songs I was involved, and I played all his songs for seven years. Maggie May, We Do You Keep Me Hanging On, like Rod did it. Which that was on the first album, yeah. you know, and the audience goes crazy, you know. So I get to play these songs again. I saw Rod a couple of years ago, and I, <clears throat> I said, I never get to play these songs. I wanted to do this. I, I met this guy that was running the show, and he said, let's be partners. I said, let's go. So if you look at my website, commonapiece.com, I have a whole lot of gigs with that. Yeah. I love it. Because I never get to play those songs. So let's just say you're in, in an office and you're in a waiting room and someone's beside you. And I'm not saying they recognize you or don't, but they're going to say, hey, uh, strike up conversation. And then he says, what do you do? If you open that can of worms. I'll say I, I'm, a music, I, I'm a rock drummer. Oh, yeah. Who'd you play with? I started, I played with Vanilla Fudge. I never heard of those guys. Okay, I play with Rod Stewart. Oh, when did you play with Rod Stewart? Like that. I usually go from the beginning to the middle, you know. Like, uh, funny, with this new look I have, you know, I stopped dyeing my hair, and, and uh, my wife said, why don't you comb it back? And now I look like a mafia guy, you know, especially if I put the sunglasses on, you know. I'm Joe like, Mafia, you know. And uh, I'm at the store in, in Florida, young girl's packing up. She goes, are you a movie star? <laughs> I said, no, I'm a rock star. You know, so hold on. I am so proud of the album and really proud of the drum sound and the energy that's on the album. You know, because the fact that I did it in my house, you know. Now How'd you get that drum sound, by the way? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Well, I learned from Andy Johns. I work with Rod and other projects. The placement of the microphones to get that sound. I have two bass drums out of 1971 Cactus bass drums, funny enough. They're one inch bigger than most bass drums. And I have great toms from D drum that I play. And I have a, a Radio King Slingle and snare drum from 2004. And every drum sounds great on their own. And then with the miking that they taught me, yeah. and then I give it to my engineer, Pat, and he fine tunes it. And we come up with this monster kick ass present but big ambient drum sound, you know? And it's and it's some of the best drum sounds I've gotten on record, I think. Yeah. yeah I can say that and and Guitar Zeus and Pat Regan did Guitar Zeus with me too. And uh, it's a fantastic drum sound. So, and then everything else, Pat's great at mixing, but the drum sound, you know, I had to tape up some of my cymbals so they're not too loud because it's in a guest house. The drums were in what was the living room, right? The, the room mics are in, uh, there's a double door and the drums are here and there's the room mics on each side of the double door wind like wall so that the sound doesn't go direct into the mics. It goes around to the mics and they're low. So you don't get a lot of cymbals. So they had to tape up cymbals that were too loud, you know, to make them just enough ring 
because I don't like symbols that go like. I like it to be a quarter and a like boom, 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 and out just to hear it, and but not overpower. So by fine tuning all this over, I've had it there for like four years in August. I've been developing, and I'm I'm the engineer for my drums. That's why I, and it's recorded in my Realistic Rock Studios, which is named after my drum book, right? And my my wife was called the Radio Chick in New York. But she's the radio chick studio and the, the, where the bedroom is. She does podcasts now, you know, and, uh, you know, you just learn what, what works and what doesn't work. I changed a couple of mics here and there, you know, and the room sound. I mean, I went to my brother's house and he does, he made, he built the system for me. He's a computer geek. He built the computer, put together everything I needed to record. He sent it to me and we went over to show me how to work it. And in his, his house, he's got all this stuff on the walls to soundproof. I don't have nothing. I just got gold records behind me, wall. I got a rug and I got some curtains. And the sound in that room just sounds great. It sound, it's just one of them things. It sounds great. So, so that's it. So I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying playing in there. I'm doing, I, I got some things going on with Cleopatra, some different kind of projects I have to do with AI. And uh, yeah, I'm happy. I get to do stuff that's new, like this cactus album was a new experience. It was a new thing to try and do, even though I did it with guitars. This is different to do with everybody. Yeah. And just the drums were the only thing that was constant. You, know? you gave new meaning to the, uh, the this conversation to me, even though I know they were all there and I know why they were on the cover. The Sgt. Pepper thing I thought of right away. But the, the, it gives me new meaning about the fact that these most almost everyone they're they're fans. I mean that's that's just yeah. Me too. I was kind of freaked out, you know. I mean, I I had a feeling Joe Bonamassa was a fan because every time he'd play in town, McCarty would come and he'd bring him up to play. Now I don't think he plays with him now because he's playing big play at big arenas. But when he was coming up more, when he played like you know five eight hundred seat thousand seat clubs. You know, McCarty would go and play with him, or maybe a theater, but now he's playing arenas. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but I knew he was, I knew Ted was, I knew King's X was, but there was some, like I said, that I didn't know. You know they, were, they were fine to find out. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. Love the album and take good care of yourself, man. Okay, brother. Thank you. See ya. Remember, if you want to help the channel, you can make a donation. We have a PayPal link at the very top of the description. You can also join our Patreon. You'll get early access to our videos. And go to our swag store. There's a link. All the links, by the way, are at the very top of the description of this video and every video we have, where you can buy a T-shirt, a T-top, a baseball cap, or even a coat with Rock History Music, Rock History Book, or Rock History Canada on there. People will think you're on staff. Subscribe to our channel, share our videos, comment on them, and like them as well. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book. Take care of yourself.